Hey again, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Indie Corner. This time, we're going to be taking a nice little look at a game I can recently say I conquered, finally, thank God, Lone Survivor. So let's get right down to it. What exactly is Lone Survivor? Lone Survivor is a game done by Jasper Byrne and Superflat Games, both of which have a decent repertoire behind them, and you can easily Google either one and see the games that they've produced. I will also have links in the description below so you can check it out yourself. But Lone Survivor itself is a love letter of sorts. It's a love letter and a retro horror game all at the same time. Who exactly is the letter written to? Well, that's kind of easy if you've played the game. It's pretty much written to those who loved Silent Hill 2 and games similar to it. If Silent Hill 2 had been released in the 16-bit era of oh-so-glorious gaming, along the sides of Super Mario World and the like, it would no doubtedly look and play much like Lone Survivor does. And for doing that, I can appreciate it. It's unique, it's kind of fun, its story is exceptionally strong, its environments achieve that sense of loneliness and paranoia it's obviously trying to capture, and its art style is quite good to top it all off. Where this game falters, and falters relatively hard, is the gameplay mechanics. For a game that teaches you to avoid enemies quite early on and get away from a lot of enemy encounters, it gives you a means to defend yourself only in the most dire of circumstances. But quite often, in the mid and later game, it will shove you into areas where you cannot hide and you pretty much have to fight for your life, no choice. But more on that a little bit later, I want to get into what I was talking about a little earlier, how Silent Hill has so heavily influenced Lone Survivor. When I first booted up Lone Survivor, my immediate reaction was, wow, this guy really, really loves Silent Hill. From the art style to the sound design, there are tons of subtle nods to the fans of the Konami series. But upon playing and getting further into it, it quickly became clear that in fact Lone Survivor is its very own beast. Sure, it's heavily inspired by the Silent Hill series, but what other games don't have inspirations? What it takes from Silent Hill are all the very best parts. An intriguing story, interesting monster design, great level design, and an audio that could kill. But let's rewind to the opening of Silent Hill 2 for a minute. It sets a very interesting stage. You are James Sunderland and received a letter from your dead wife to come to Silent Hill, that she's there waiting for you. Restless dreams. I see that town. Silent Hill. You promised you'd take me there again someday. But you never did. Well, I'm alone there now. In our special place. Waiting for you. When James Sunderland receives a letter, he tells himself it's impossible, that it's not even probable that his wife's going to be there, but he goes anyway. And all the while, while he's talking, if you listen to him, his delivery of his lines are very dry. They're very nonchalant, and I mean, he just doesn't seem to care. There's not a lot of sense of anxiety, of excitement, of worry in his voice. Now, you could chalk that up to either bad voice acting in the early uh, stages of this type of storytelling game, 
Or you can just chalk it up to the fact that he seems to mildly accept the fact that his wife is dead and sent him this letter. Sure, he's curious about how it's possible, but go back and listen to his lines. As I said, there's just no sense of emotion. The nonchalance is tangible. Sooner or later, we, the player, begin to wonder if Silent Hill is a real place, or if James is just crazy. I got a letter. The name on the envelope said, Mary. My wife's name. It's ridiculous. Couldn't possibly be true. That's what I keep telling myself. A dead person can't write a letter. Mary died of that damn disease three years ago. And that's what I'm trying to hammer home. That sense of something that's just not quite right, right from the beginning of the game. And Lone Survivor does something very similar. He seems to accept the fact that his life is what it is. He's almost okay with the world being complete crap in front of him. And it just seems to him that this is his every day. When we take control of the protagonist, he's holed up in an apartment that may or may not be his, living on bare essentials, and there are monsters roaming everywhere in the apartment complex. But in the art that portrays him in the opening scene and in his dialogue, he seems to be okay with it. We don't know how long things have been like this, we don't know how the disease came about, and quickly we start to even question his sanity, and if what we're seeing is real. This is how the story takes hold of us. The story is being told through his eyes, little subtle hints to the truth are everywhere in the game. And if we just pay attention to every detail, by the end of the story we can piece it all together and have those eureka moments where something earlier in the game just seemed outright crazy now makes sense. And that's something they pulled almost directly from Silent Hill 2. That sense of little tidbits of truth of the story hidden throughout the game just coming together at the end. And that's one of this game's biggest strengths. So back to when I said this game is good. It is. It does a lot right and I want to talk about what it does right and why it's done so well. Lone Survivor's strongest hand is its story and the means in which it tells it. The story is told through the character's actions, his dreams, the monsters, environment, and art. It's everywhere. Everything you do affects how the game reacts and plays. The endings change depending on what you do. Take a lot of pills for sleep or to stay awake? The game's gonna remember that and your character is gonna act differently, have more lucid dreams that may or may not be useful, or stay awake and start hallucinating. Do you attempt to shoot your way down the hall or do you attempt to s the sneaky route? Believe it or not, this affects the ending, the game remembers those choices. There are three endings to the game and you are responsible for your character's sanity, sleep, and hunger, all of which affect the outcome. How well you maintain all of that will direct you toward a pacific ending, and as I said earlier, keep an eye out on your surroundings. The story is told everywhere. Now, there is a part of this game I have uh, kind of a gripe with, and if you guys watched my gameplay commentary, it's, uh, it's pretty obvious, and if you haven't, feel free to click the link and, and watch from beginning to end. There's some pretty hilarious moments throughout. Now, it may be a bit nitpicky of me, but there's no doubt this game could have benefited from a bit of a tune-up. Um, and by that, there's, there's about three things that I kind of have a gripe with. Let's, the first one's pretty simple, it's the inventory system. The inventory system is clunky as hell. It's not smooth, it's difficult to navigate, and sometimes it's hard to tell what you're looking at just by looking at the icon. Um, give yourself some time to get used to it if you decide to play this game, and you should be okay. It, it's worth it just to get used to the inventory system. Overall, I'm not terribly impressed with it, but it's not broken by any means, it's just not polished. Now we get to the one that I probably have the biggest gripe with, the combat. Oh dear, sweet, zombie-loving Jesus, the combat. Early in the game, it teaches you how to lure enemies with rotten meat and hide in little cubby hose, holes blah, to avoid them. Shortly thereafter, it gives you a gun, and basically, it's basically telling you that the gun's only used for emergency situations. But, sooner or later, you're going to come to the basement and want to put a bullet in your own head from that gun. God damn the pain. The pain of playing through the basement and having flashbacks right now. Look, I'm okay with forced combat as long as it works. The problem is the gun really only works well if you're shooting them in the head or the legs. But the targeting system is so bad that it's only going to work if you're close enough to whisper in their ears. Top it off with the fact that it's forced, meaning gosh 
darn it, there's no way to hide, which is a problem in a game that teaches you to hide early on. Sure, there are flares that incapacitate enemies temporarily, but you need to trade ammo for them, or take pills to restock them, both of which will negatively affect your sanity for a worse end outcome. And god forbid you get lost and go the wrong way while using your last flare because the map is friggin' incomprehensible. See where I'm going with this? There just wasn't enough time put into the combat. In the map, dear god, the map, the third problem. The map is a top-down map portraying a 3D environment when you're playing a side-scrolling 2D game. When you think you're going left, and that left is gonna lead up on the map, it's actually leading down, so you need to go right to go up. Ugh, oh, it's confusing as hell. You're gonna get lost. But outside of these gripes, which are legitimate gripes, the game is a very solid game. It's fun, again, it's creepy as hell, and it portrays an excellent story, which is really what the game is trying to do. Unfortunately, some of the gameplay mechanics just don't hold up to the caliber of the story. If you can get past that, the game is well worth it. So, my final statement. Who is this game targeted at? Simple answer. If you love games like Silent Hill, creepy monsters, a mind-bending story, and a world with endings that you decide is your kind of thing, then this is the game for you. After you beat the game, plan on sitting back, watching the ending, and thinking on it for a while. It's worth just digesting, like a delicious turkey dinner on Thanksgiving, figuring it out on your own. Then, after you've determined if you've understood the ending, go back, play it again, see a different ending. The world is rich, it's deep, it's downright creepy. And I know I came out with a positive experience overall. So is it worth buying? Obviously, that's going to be left up to you to decide. Hopefully, my little video here has helped you figure out what kind of game this is and if it's going to be suited to your playstyle. I say yes. Short answer, it's worth picking up. It's 10 bucks. It's about 46 hours of gameplay, and it's really good. Um, if you can get over little gripes like the combat, the map, and the inventory, it's well worth playing. There's a lot here to see. And this is not Jasper Burns' first rodeo. He's done things like this before, so you're not going to expect something that some new developers put together. So go check it out if it's worthwhile, and if you don't want to play it, feel free to watch my gameplay commentary. Again, link in the video, and I hope you guys enjoyed an ep second episode of Indie Corner. I know I did, and I'm looking forward to putting more effort and more time into the upcoming ones, and hopefully making this something that's almost as professional as I believe it to be. This is Matt the StarCraft, and I thank you so much for watching Indie Corner, and I'll see you next time.